the second wave feminists I've talked to, they're very just uh, uh, worried about the, the kind of woke gender identity movement because it's reducing women to just body parts. Mm -hmm. Like a guy can say, well, if I just get breast implants and I can have a vaginoplasty made out of a piece mm -hmm. of my skin, uh, then I'm in, I'm a woman, right? It's like, mm -hmm. well, no, because women are not just tits and ass, right? I mean, there's yep. more to it than that. For decades, Michael Shermer has been one of the most popular and provocative explicators of science to popular audiences, having authored best-selling books such as Why People Believe Weird Things, Why Darwin Matters, The Moral Arc, and The Mind of the Market. He founded Skeptic Magazine in 1992, hosts a video podcast with leading activists and intellectuals, and for nearly 20 years, authored a widely read column for Scientific American in which he debunked beliefs in UFOs and other paranormal phenomena, explained the rise of the new atheism, and showed how evolution systematically informs human behavior. Schirmer's work is deeply and explicitly rooted in libertarian and enlightenment ideas about individual responsibility, free market economics, rationality, and the search for something approaching objective truth. In 2019, Scientific American cut him loose, a move he ascribes to the publication's suffocating embrace of the sort of identity politics and wokeness that he says dominates academic circles and, increasingly, the culture at large. Last fall, Shermer, who holds a PhD in the history of science and teaches Skepticism 101 at Chapman University, started a weekly substack where he hosts podcasts and the columns he would have written for Scientific American. The 67-year-old former competitive cyclist talked with Reason during Freedom Fest, an annual gathering in Las Vegas, about the fundamental clash between wokeness and scientific inquiry, how hard it is to overcome the cognitive biases we all have, why he thinks trans athletes should be banned from most women's sports, why we have so much trouble acknowledging moral and technological progress, and why he now identifies as a classical liberal rather than as a libertarian. Michael Shermer, thanks for talking to Reason. Nice to see you again. Uh, so you, last year, last fall, you started a Substack publication to go along with Skeptic uh, Magazine and whatnot, and one of the early pieces was titled Scientific American Goes Woke, and you <laughs> were a longtime columnist for Scientific American, uh, you're a very popular um, science communicator. What describe what you wrote about in Scientific American Goes Woke and why you started a Substack? Mm, right. So I started Scientific American in two thousand one, and I went uh, almost eighteen years, two hundred fourteen consecutive yeah. monthly columns. I was going for Steve Gould's three hundred that he did in yeah. Natural History yeah. Magazine, and uh, which would have taken me to April twenty twenty five. So I didn't quite make that. Yeah. Uh, they terminated the column. They, you know, there was no particular reason given other than well, it's, we're going different ways, and you know, it's just it's time for a change. You know, they didn't say, hey, we've gone woke and you're an old, old non-woke right. guy, <laughs> right? So, yeah. But you, I could kind of see the writing in the wall. Last couple of columns I had written uh, were dealing with some issues uh, kind of related to race and, and se sex and gender and that sort of thing. And, and uh, I could feel the uncomfortableness mm -hmm. in the editorial process. And then, boom, you know, they, they let it go. So, I mean, I don't know for sure, but that, that was it. Yeah. But So I, I started the Substack just because... I still had more writing than me. I, I yep. like writing the columns, and you know, cut. but this gives me a little more flexibility. If I want to go more than seven hundred words, mm -hmm. I can go more. And right. you know, and and also the new media. I try to keep up with. You know, I have a podcast and mm -hmm. what everybody's what what all the kids are doing these yeah, days. Yeah. You know, it's hard to hard to know what's the right path to take. But it seemed like the Substack thing was a way to go. The, the finances for it, uh, you know, are channeled through the Skeptic Society, which is kind of my day job. Right. You know, so the first one, you know, Scientific American goes woke. I I, I recounted my own experiences, uh, but also I, I went through uh, a bunch of articles they had published recently mm -hmm. that were clearly what most people would identify as sort of a far left woke progressive right. politics. And, and one of the most, uh, you know, uh, notorious or, or discussed uh, pieces had to do with E.O. Wilson being a racist, right. right? Being a scientific racist. He's the, he wrote the book Sociobiology. He you know, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, his vision of taking evolution and seriously applying it or trying to apply it to human society and whatnot had always been a fraught project, right? Yes, I mean, he was right. getting pictures of water poured over him in the 70s at conferences. Yeah. Um, but that 
Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that was because, one of them. And you wrote uh, about that. Yeah, in fact, they, they published this right after he died. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the body's not even cold yeah. yet. And already he's being accused of being a, you know, kind of race realist, race science, racist, implied racist, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, even though he's not. So one of my other substacks was a long piece, mm -hmm. uh, kind of dissecting the claims against Wilson show that they're absolutely false. The, but the, the worst thing about the Scientific American piece on him was that they provided no evidence at all, no mm -hmm. quotes from him, you know, saying something about the race, r racial differences in IQ, in, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's tons of quotes from him that I included in my piece where he, he's like, this can absolutely not... Uh, be uh, considered evidence of racial differences between groups, and mm -hmm. you know, and 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 this is no justification for discrimination of any kind. Mm -hmm. You know, I I abhor the you know kind of the old race science stuff. I mean, he made it clear he doesn't go into any of that. So that was disturbing. They had another one on um, how mathematics has gone has is kind of gone uh, racist and bigoted and I don't know misogynistic. Mm -hmm. um, and and their evidence for this is that there are more male math professors than female mm -hmm. math professors, which is not, I mean, that, the, the explanation for that could be that, well, all these old guys are just race, uh, misogynists against women. But there are other hypotheses, and you mm -hmm. would think a scientific publication would say, okay, here are the three explanations for why there is an asymmetry in the number of mm -hmm. professors who are male versus female. Right. So you have, well, maybe they're just a bunch of misogynists. OK, maybe maybe there's a pipeline issue. Right. That mm -hmm. that, you know, decades ago, uh, young girls went different pathways than young boys and fewer of them ended up in STEM fields. So that mm -hmm. by the time you get to now where they're being hired, there's just few of them to select for because every professor I know is uber liberal and they're all mm -hmm. dying to hire more women in right. STEM fields. So it's not like behind closed doors, they're going, hey, you know, I know we said this publicly, but, you know, mm -hmm. we just want to hire more white guys. You know, they're not doing that. Right. So, uh, you know, what are some other hypotheses here? You know, the evolutionary psych one is, well, there may be an interest difference mm -hmm. that, you know, men migrate, to boys migrate toward toys and things and stuff. Mm -hmm. Women, girls migrate more toward uh, people. Uh, and, and so that that kind of sorts out later, decades later, into the kind of profession you prefer to go into. So uh, women tend to migrate more toward you know, medical degrees and biology and psychology, social mm -hmm. science, men more in the STEM fields. Now, which of those is the right hypothesis? Let's just set that aside. Why can't a scientific publication even say, here are the three hypotheses? Right. Let's look at the evidence. What um, Scientific American is either the oldest or one of the very oldest continuously published magazines mm -hmm. in the world, certainly in the U.S. Um, you know, and, and it went through phases in the 19th century where it's like, okay, yeah, it's talking about scientific racism. Other times it's super liberal, et cetera. What do you think is driving the publication or and the broader, I don't know, you know, kind of popular science community towards wokeism yeah. or, or, you know, yeah. a... Um, a lot of attention to identity politics, where that becomes a controlling kind of idea apart from anything that they're actually discussing. It's definitely new, and it's really just in the last five years. Mm -hmm. I think it coincides with the general trend in, uh, in culture in general of mm -hmm. moving more in that direction. As younger people get those jobs and are kind of moving up the demographic scale, um, they're getting more and more powerful jobs to direct things the way they want. They came of age you know, when those subjects were really important. Now, there's not much any one of us can do like about the George Floyd incident or mm -hmm. this thing or that thing that we see on the news constantly. Uh, but I can do something. I can say, well, look, I, I, I'm not a police chief. I'm not a mayor, mm -hmm. but I'm an editor. So I can kind of tilt the editorial decisions mm -hmm. more toward the kinds of political um, directions we want to take the country, and I'm doing my little share, and I yeah. think it makes people feel like I'm doing something, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like again, I, I, you know, what can I do about the George Floyd thing or police violence or whatever? Nothing, but I can go down and march, right? I'm going right. down there this afternoon, and I'm going to carry my. Mm -hmm. it makes me feel like I'm doing something because you know humans are very moral or moralistic. We like to moralize about things and and and, and express. Are, uh, and outrage. that kind of protest does have effect, right? Yes, it can. Okay. Right, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You, so you mentioned earlier on, you know, kind of being of an older vintage. We're of similar vintage. How old are you? I'm 67. Okay, so 
Is part of this just like, you know, and we call it wokeism, you know, 20 years ago, we would have called it political correctness. Right. Um, I think our parents were, you know, we disappointed them or we, we defined ourselves against them. Is part of the woke conversation real? It's just generational warfare that is to be expected. And if not tolerated, like, you know, of course, right? I mean, this is a way, I, you know, and I hate to say it in this crude a term, but like, so you're a guy, you're you're an old guy, you've been at on the mass set of Scientific American for 20 years. And it's like, we, you know, you're not retiring. You're, in be, you're probably in better health than you were 10 years ago. <laughs> and it looks like you're going to live forever. Like, how the fuck do we get rid of you? <laughs> right. Uh, so, yeah, have we become our parents? Uh, there may be a little bit of that, just kind of mm -hmm. a generational shifts, but, but, but that doesn't really matter. The question is, what's the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. What's the truth? What, what's the direction we want to take the country? And what do we really know about this subject or that subject, yeah. right? So, I mean, if I may, I mean, you have in one of the Substack columns, a fantastic piece where you say your uh, raison d'etre is to figure out what is right, not to be right. Yeah. Um, that's right. a right. powerful statement. Can you kind of expand on that a little bit. Yes, well, because because I study belief systems for a living and, and I'm, I'm aware of all the cognitive biases, mm -hmm. I can see them in myself. And so to avoid that, you just have to kind of focus on, instead of looking for evidence, confirmation bias to support mm -hmm. what I already believe, got to look for the counter evidence. You know, mm -hmm. what, are, what are the arguments against the, the beliefs I hold? Like this issue on abortion, I'm hardcore pro-choice, but I purposely solicited a pro-life argument and said, please give me like the 10 best arguments you have. Mm -hmm. I want to hear them, right? Because yeah. I don't really know what they are because I don't pay attention to that closely, mm -hmm. right? So we end up doing that. that. That you have to do in general. And is are you is wokeism, uh, for lack of a better term, but or identity politics, is it, are you worried about it, uh, not because you, know, you lose your Scientific American column uh, as much as this means we're not focused on trying to figure out what is right, what is true, what is correct, yeah, but rather right. we're... Yeah kind of trying to create a narrative and maintain yeah. things that may or may not be true. Yeah, the word woke is pretty loaded now and it's mm -hmm. changed already. I heard John McWhorter talking about this, the linguist. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it used to be a cool term. I mean, you and I would have been woke probably in the 90s because we were libertarian in favor of individual freedom right. and rights or whatever. And now that word is means something completely different. Yeah. So, but in general, and I don't, I don't want to pick on Scientific American, I, mm -hmm. I, I like the people I work with there and so forth. It's happening across the board. Twitter is mostly run by, you know, these kind of woke yeah. progressives. And, you know, most sci science and nature, the two most prominent mm -hmm. publications are running articles about this you know the and the lancet had that uh, cover story of uh, you know we have long medicine is long neglected uh what was it people who give birth right you know, like if only we had a word for this right <laughs> right that kind of thing so you know the but, language, uh, but there is a truth i mean like beyond the language terminology it is true that like women you know women who give birth were off oftentimes in medical discourse were kind of seen as like bystanders well, yes. Right. right. So there is a right. sociology here that's worth kind of rehearsing and understanding and unpacking. Well, and I think the the, the second wave feminists I've talked to, mm -hmm. like Helen Joyce, Carol Tavers, they're mm -hmm. very dis, uh, uh, worried about the, the kind of woke gender identity movement because it's reducing women to just body parts. Mm -hmm. Like a guy can say, well, if I just get breast implants and I can have a vaginoplasty made out of a piece mm -hmm. of my skin, uh, and I'm in, I'm a woman, right? It's mm -hmm. like, well, no, because women are not just tits and ass, right? I mean, there's yep. more to it than that. A lot more. That's a very <laughs> 70s woke uh, analysis. You know, women are more than tits and ass. Yes. That's like yes. very progressive. Uh, before we talk about, I want to I talk about trans issues and abortion and uh, gun control and a couple of other things. Because you've written, you know, your Substack is absolutely one of like my must reads. It's, I, I appreciate it because... I didn't have a subscription to Scientific American and I didn't always go there and you can go long. So, and I also want to talk about, you have a, a great piece about independent media and why that's important, especially mm -hmm. in today's mm -hmm. kind of cancel culture world. Mm -hmm. But before we get there, and this goes to that question of you want to be right, uh, you want to find out what is right, but not be right. You started out, uh, you're, you used to call yourself a libertarian mm -hmm. and now you say, I'm, I'm not a libertarian anymore. I'm a classical liberal. And just as a kind of framing device, how, how is that related? What does that mean and how is that related to your 
interest in finding out what is right, not being right. Yeah, well, the language does matter, and the word libertarian has gotten a lot of baggage over the past quarter century or so. I mean, here we are at Freedom Fest. There's mm -hmm. quite a wide range of people and that believe rather different things. But to the general public, it's like, oh, those are those people, that the preppers that want to think the world's going to end, got to get Bitcoin and gold and guns. And, you know, it's like, well, I'm not really one of those. Right. And, uh, you know, and also, uh, you know, when this, you called yourself a libertarian, what what did libertarianism that was, mean to you? I think more of a kind of an Ayn Rand, you know, just everybody, you just be self-reliance, be re self-responsible. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the core would be the individual. Mm -hmm. as the fundamental unit of society mm -hmm. and their autonomy mm -hmm. and liberty to make the choices they want, right? So this is my concern about conservatives. Um, they, they say that, you know, we believe in liberty and autonomy mm -hmm. and so, but they don't, you know, they very much right. care what consenting adults do in the privacy of their bedrooms because mm -hmm. they think it's going to leak out and cause the moral corruption of, of the family and then the community and then the society mm -hmm. and then the nation. And, and I think that's the wrong focus because that's kind of a collectivist argument, right? right? The nation is over the society. Well, it is true. I think it was Rick Santorum and Bill O'Reilly at various points talked about how you have gay marriage and then the next thing yes. you know, men right. are marrying ducks. Right. And obviously we're all <laughs> right. engaged right. to waterfowl, right? right. So <laughs> yeah. they're not. So how, why does classical liberal, like, why do you think that's a better descriptor for you? I guess I like the word, it, I don't know, it has this sort of a gravitas to it. Mm -hmm. I like it. And it, it, by his, the way historians talk about the founding fathers, and the, mm -hmm. though they were classical liberals, and you mm -hmm. kind of look back and go, yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. I like that. Yeah. Uh, just as a kind of a, well, a fuzzy set, as I call it, or yeah. a family resemblance of a concept, a, a schema mm -hmm. that allows us to capture a bunch of stuff without firm borders where, mm -hmm. you know, we can overlap and we're both this, but you believe that and I believe that and that's okay. And you have a wonderful column about the Kardashian. You use yeah. family, uh, you know, a Wittgensteinian uh, <laughs> yeah. family resemblance concept and you use the Kardashians, which is kind of a great way to think about it because there is something, I don't want to say essential, but there is kind of something essential to being a Kardashian, even if you don't have the same parents or the same genetics, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So right. so classical liberal for you, that you know, that kind of fuzzy set or family right. resemblance. Right. Um, and for libertarian, you think over the past twenty five years it's become too kind of prepper, too extreme. It's a little or? too yeah, a little fringy, but also a little hyper focused on the individual. It's not like hmm. we should be free to do absolutely anything anytime we want. Of course, that's not true. You can't drive on the right side of the road or the left side of the road yeah. on any given day, however you feel that day, right? right? We give up our freedoms all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the if you read the Federalist Papers, they, they, this is what they talk about all the time. Well, hmm. We want to give people freedom, but, you know, of course, we have to have this and that. And we need a standing so army. Do you and, think the libertarian has become synonymous with anarchism? Well, that or, that's an old mistake people used to make. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you have to correct that. No, I think it's more affiliated with like, you know, Ron Paul, Rand Paul. Mm -hmm. I don't know the the kind of Second Amendment fundamentalists. Yeah. You know, the gun nutters. Uh, so preppers. it's we're going to talk about gun nuts. Uh, preppers <laughs> fit into that, and also Christians, right? Evangelical Christians. Um, Ron Paul and Rand Paul yes, are Baptists. Yes. Uh, well, libertarians are kind of over all over the map on religiosity, right? Yeah. I mean, you guys have done s surveys on this. Some of them are religious, but others yeah. are not. Yeah. No, and you have, <laughs> on the one hand, you have people like Ayn Rand, and then you have people like Ron Paul. And, you know, certainly over the past 20 years, Ron Paul is probably the single biggest factor when people say, I become libertarian. It's because they've encountered Ron Paul. So he's right, a right. huge, you know, uh, tributary into libertarian the libertarian movement um and do you think um you know if you're if you're kind of an evangelical christian um can you be uh obviously everybody can call themselves libertarian but can, are you could you be in that family uh of yeah, people who I, yeah. what what so what is the i think kind of what's the right. what's the litmus test or what's the maginot line there where you're like I, okay i can't do this i anymore. would say consistency of principles across different issues mm -hmm. and uh, i'm more critical of conservatives than libertarians yeah. on that for sure uh, but like when when desantis uh, sick the government on disney Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not crazy about Disney's woke progressive politics and right. we're going to introduce these characters into our cartoons. 
okay, well, you know, but but the libertarian way of dealing with that, or what should have been the old conservative way of dealing yeah. with that, is well, I'm just not going to go to uh, and and uh, and give my money to Disney. I won't go to their right. films. I won't go to their parks and so on. But DeSantis is like, no, the conservative thing to do is we're going to slap them with, you know, with mm -hmm. with higher taxes and regulations. It's like, when did that become a conservative thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I and, and I I do think libertarians are like, okay. Where's the consistency, say, for foreign policy? You know, mm -hmm. what you, don't we have a moral obligation to help people that are under um, the suppression of civil liberties mm -hmm. around the world? You know, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Where's the balance there? I don't know. I guess as a fuzzy set, I would say classical yeah. liberalism and libertarianism, they're, they're either in the same or they're two very overlapping yeah. sets. No, and you're not alone in this. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, Penn Jillette, obviously, famously also kind of has yeah. voiced similar misgivings. And uh, it's interesting when high profile libertarians like yourself start to say, you know what, I, I don't know, I kind of want to be in a, a different club. Um, and again, I wonder if part of it is generational. Um, I mean, because when you say, you know, kind of like Second Amendment people, do you feel like the movement is more focused on gun rights now than it was in 1990? Uh, now it is, yes, yeah. because of all the mass public shootings and the government response to this. Mm -hmm. And that drives up gun sales. So, you know, ironically, Obama probably did more for gun sales than right. anybody, yeah. <laughs> even though he actually never did much. Right, in terms right. Of no, he actually, uh, in his first term, he uh, he allowed uh, people to carry weapons on Amtrak in a national park. So <laughs> right. he actually was liberalizing. Right. But yeah, people yeah. certainly fundraised against the idea that he was a gun grabber. Well, we've seen this kind of inconsistency, my body, my choice, mm -hmm. uh, in the two different issues of abortion yeah. and uh, vaccines. Mm -hmm. And each side is like, you know, pretty hypocritical about this. Do yeah. you feel with COVID, um, is that also a place where, you know, libertarian, uh, libertarian skepticism towards state power uh, is one thing. And yeah. then, you know, but you also want good science and good public policy. Yeah. And then there was a lot within the libertarian movement, I think, there was a lot of not simply being anti-vaccine mandates, but being anti-vaccine. See here, I, I would say the libertarian position would be, I don't like mandates. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's the yeah. consistency of principle, government forcing you to do something. But on the other hand, to say, well, but if the vaccines really work mm -hmm. and the CDC and Fauci are saying we should all get them, if I go along with that, then the next step is going to be the mandates, and I don't want that, so I'm going to be skeptical of the science. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. It's okay to just say, look, we should all do this. And by the right. way, most of us really should get vaccinated. They, they yeah. work. Uh, and, and there is, within your conception of libertarianism, there is a public... I mean, you're not an anarchist. You believe the state has legitimacy in certain right, roles, and right. that there are... And, you know, I would argue maybe COVID is not that case, but that... If there is a communicable disease and there is a vaccine that prevents me from giving it to you, whether you ask for it or not, there's a role for the state to say, no, yes. you have to get mandated, you yeah. have to get vaccinated. In the same way, you have to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, well, we have now to have... you're really in the Yeah, state, I know. Right? We, yeah, yeah. we need a standing army. Yeah. We need a police force yeah. and, uh, you know, and so forth uh, to protect our, our freedoms and our property rights and so on. How are you going to do that? Mm -hmm. And if you say, well, I, I don't, I'm not participating. I don't, I'm not paying taxes. You didn't sign that social contract, so yeah, you'll free right. ride. But, so right. you, you would say um, you did not, you did not change uh, libertarianism. Changed, <laughs> maybe, right? yeah, maybe, know. or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's talk about your abortion uh, pieces because this is also something I'm. So I'm uh, 50. I'm about to turn 59, and when I I joined Reason in '93, and I I had but grown up reading Reason, so I, and that's how I became libertarian. And I would say everybody I knew who was a libertarian basically said either they were pro-choice affirmatively that abortion, uh, at least through a certain point in pregnancy, mm -hmm. was a woman's right and it was nobody's business, and that it was not a morally bad issue. It might be morally complicated. Um, and that even people who were pro-life would say, you know, this is not something the state should be involved in. Mm -hmm. That no longer seems to be the case among mm -hmm. libertarians. Yeah. Um, and in, even though it still seems to be the case in the public at large, only about 20 percent, according to Gallup, are against abortion under all circumstances. That's been very consistent since Roe was it's, decided. Yeah, it's religion. Yeah, so I mean, Reagan was pro-choice until, as, as well, I understand yeah. it, Jerry Falwell sat him down and said, I can deliver you millions of votes. 
that you got to get, yeah. get religion. I'm not to. sure if that's, I mean, he definitely signed a, you know, a very liberal law in California as governor and then right. at various points recanted. And I'm not sure of the yeah. motivation for that. But, you know, what you, you say, and I, I found this really fascinating because you said, I am pro-choice. And you started out definitely very, you know, pro-abortion basically through the term uh, of pregnancy. And now you are still pro-choice, but it's more complicated. Can you can you make the case for, you know, why abortion should be allowed? Okay. Well, first of all, I, I, I'll I'll give a nod to the pro-lifers mm-hmm. that it, it is a human life that's developing. Mm-hmm. You know, from the day one, it's a potential human life. It's not a legal yeah. person and so forth. And so, you know, here is, you know, what Richard Dawkins calls the tyranny of the discontinuous mind. If, you, if you're if you stuck in black and white, on or off, mm-hmm. it's only two sides, there's no continuum, you're going to get very confused in your thinking about these kinds of issues, right. right? So you have to draw the line somewhere. You know, why is why is a 17-year-old not allowed to whatever vote or something yeah. that an 18 year old can yeah. on the, the next day. Okay. Well, it's just because the law has to draw the line somewhere. Yeah. Science doesn't have that kind of demarcation. Right. right? So uh, we do those kinds of things all the time. And, and uh, so I'm willing to say you're right. It's a life. Um, but the female, the mother is also a life right. and it's also a legal person and far more advanced than the two day old mm-hmm. fetus or the three month old fetus or whatever. So, you know, as Thomas Sowell says, there are no solutions. There's just compromises. Hmm. And when you have conflicting rights, something has to give like the trans athletes, you know, women's rights, trans rights that conflict when mm-hmm. men want to compete in women's divisions. Something has to go. You can't have both. Yeah. So we just have to make a decision. Whose rights should we uh, favor in this case. So in, in that case, I say, well, the adult woman should be given the nod. Mm-hmm. Uh, just in principle, you know, individual autonomy and liberty and control over your own body, that's fundamental. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, even while saying, but don't put yourself in that position where you have to make that choice. It's right. not a good choice uh, to have to make, you know, it, it happens. So, okay, we should, it should be your choice to do if you want to. But, you know, as I tell my students, you know, two words, birth control, right? <laughs> right? Just yeah. be, you know, be, be prepared. Are you satisfied with the, you know, or not satisfied, but how do you feel about the Dobbs decision, which gets rid of the right of abortion at the national level? So now you had invoked yeah. the Federalist Papers yeah. and just thinking about federalism. And now we have 50 states that are laboratories of right. democracy. Right. Which, it sounds good in principle. Um, right. But yeah. because I know a lot of pro-lifers and they're all pretty much evangelical Christians mm-hmm. and, you know, overturning Roe is just the first step. Mm-hmm. They want to ban in every state. They will chase people down to the bitter end to get them to stop having mm-hmm. abortions of, in, their, in any conditions. And that scares me. Yeah. So it's, it's, Do you worry that on the flip side of that, that, um, you know, some states are now going that are pro-life or pro-choice are going to, you know, where they might have had um, regulation of abortion in, mm-hmm. you know, the second after viability uh, or, uh, you know, uh, in later in the pregnancy are going to be like, OK, as a response to, you know, if we're California and we're neighboring a state that is getting rid of all, of, you know, life begins at the moment of conception, we're going to say uh, abortion is allowed until the moment of birth. Yeah. I mean, right. So there's extremists on both sides. You yeah. know, the, so the pro-choicers that say it should be OK to abort your fetus the day before you're supposed to give birth. That, mm-hmm. Of course, that's wrong. You know, and again, you get away from the binary thinking, and then you yeah. can see a spectrum. Yeah, okay. So let's just draw the line. I don't know, three months in like Germany is three months, maybe four months. Right. You know, and then, and then, okay. So that's like the age seventeen to eighteen. Well, okay, there, right there. That's yeah. the that's the time. And Do then, you feel like we? I mean, and this is interesting when you're talking about kind of gradient thinking or. You know, things on a continuum that uh, to me and I, we, we've talked about postmodernism versus, uh, you know, kind of uh, modernism or whatever in the past. But it's, you know, in the 21st century, it seems like on certain levels, we're much more comfortable with gradients and, and, mm-hmm. and a kind of range of options. And we realize that things are kind of continuous. It's not even though this is the digital age, it's not, you know, black <laughs> and white. It's not one and zero. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. But on other levels, we seem to be you know, I mean, and the abortion question is, you know, seems to be front and center on this. Of like, no, it is either murder at all stages or it is not. Right. Um, and that right. just seems like a terrible way to kind of be engaging yeah, reality. Exactly. exactly. Right. And again, on the consistency issue, if, you know, if conservatives are really pro-life, you know, they don't seem to be very pro-life after you're born. 
right? Mm -hmm. This is George Carlin's riff. Right. You know, after that, you're on your own, you know. Yeah. Now, of course, Christian's, well, because he, he does that riff about, you know, no preschool support, no school lunches, no help for single right. moms, and on and on and on. Of course, the conservatives will say, no, 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 it's we just don't want the government providing those. That's right. the job of religion yeah. or whatever. And then he throws in the, the little line, until you become military age, and then right. we're interested yeah. in you again. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's some truth to that humor, right? right. And so, again, that consistency. Uh you know, if you really Why is cared. consistency so important to you? And I mean, this is true of libertarians, right? Uh, yeah. You know, post even, you know, uh, lapsed libertarians or whatever, like, you know, and when I talk to most people, like, I'm always like, well, I got, you know, is this logical? Does it make sense? Does it work all the way through? Most people are like, I don't give a shit. Like, this is what I believe here. This is what I believe here. And they don't have to be consistent. Yeah. yeah. Well, because if you have a principle that's based on some factual uh, mm -hmm. basis that it, you know, it should be applied consistently as consistently as possible with the recognition there may be a few exceptions mm -hmm. here and yeah, there yeah. but that's the, the whole point of having a principle is that you apply it evenly across mm -hmm. the board right and uh so again i just think uh, you know people are inconsistent about that yeah for obvious reasons you know i just want what's good for me and my tribe yeah and uh you know it's like it's like the the issue over um um uh, that the private prayer that the high school football coach gave right 50 yards. The line. private prayer the yeah, private on the 50 prayer. on the 50 yard line. Yeah, with line. the players around him and he's a Christian. Okay. And of course Christian's Voluntary. going, "Yes, this is yeah, great." He, yeah. you know, the Supreme Court voted in his favor. Yeah, well, what if he was down there saying Alu Akbar? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Right, We're right. not going to allow that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, so what's the principle here? Yeah, thankfully uh, as th this is what Satanists exist for, they they're already <laughs> filing to do satanic prayers oh, on the 50 yes, yard line. Yes, that's right. And and you know yeah. this also like takes us away from the question of like okay well is football like why why are high schools playing football? Yeah, well, I don't know, you yeah. know like I was a taxpayer I'm kind of like I they can't even teach our kids to read and now <laughs> no, right. they're giving them brain damage or whatever right. that's a separate <laughs> issue. Well let's uh, let's talk about uh, trans athletes and what is a woman. You uh, wrote most recently, you looked at Matt Walsh's uh, documentary, mm -hmm. What is a Woman? And, you know, he is a right wing troll. He, mm -hmm. you know, wants to make fun of feminists. He wants to make fun of gender activists and things like that. But the documentary you found pretty compelling and interesting. Was, Can I you talk a bit about that? I was that? expecting something of a Borat like mm -hmm. send up or a Milo Yiannopoulos mm -hmm. kind of troll. And it wasn't that bad. Yeah. I, I've seen him elsewhere. And yes, he's definitely in the kind of that Ben Shapiro classical conservative mm -hmm. issues and I disagree with him on most of his beliefs but I but what made the film powerful is he's not saying the things that are crazy it's right. the people he's interviewing yeah and it's not like he like Borat he gets a couple guys drunk and <laughs> they start yammering away about the blacks and the Jews or whatever and, yeah you know, here's the underbelly of America he's not doing anything like that right. He's going to the, you know, here's a professor of gender studies. Mm -hmm. You know, what is a woman? It's right mm -hmm. there in your title, gender, women studies. Right. You know, what is a woman? This guy can't answer the question. <laughs> okay. So what what's going on here? I mean, these are smart people. So the problem here, I think, is we're on, back to the postmodernism. Mm -hmm. Like, I learned from you that, you know, the original postmodernism was really good. It's kind of a mm -hmm. form of skepticism. Right. Let's challenge the mainstream dogmas back in the 40s and 50s. And see, yeah, that's good. Right. And then it kind of just run, run, mm -hmm. run amok and goes too far. And I think that's what's happened here where uh, and then this particular professor said, you're just trying to tag me with an essentialist definition of gender. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Because to have a fuzzy set or a family resemblance, you need some agreed upon words that we're going to use mm -hmm. of characteristics that define this thing. And that's the essence of, you know, so it's the gametes, right? Biologists say, well, a woman and a man is, is defined by right. their gametes. You're either making sperm or you're making eggs. That's it. And everything else follows from that. And mm -hmm. if you look under the hood, there's a thousand different differences in the body that go toward sperm production mm -hmm. and development and so on, or egg production and development of the fetus and whatnot. And it, it's not just whatever my inner feelings are. Mm -hmm. And that would be you know, kind of the most extreme of postmodernism. Whatever I feel is the truth, right. it's my truth. And that's essentially what Walsh's film shows, that mm -hmm. these people have gone that far. Whatever it is you say it is, that's what it is. And why do you think the trans issue, uh, you've also written about how, you know, in the, when these poll results came out, I guess earlier this year, it was kind of stunning that 
Uh, if you look at older, you know, the, the silent generation, uh, the, the percentage of people who identify as LGBT, so lesbian, gay, mm -hmm. uh, bi, and trans, very flat, baby boomers flat, uh, Gen X flat, millennials it picks up a little bit, and then Gen Z yeah, uh, so people right. are basically what, under like 25. Right. It is, right. you know, 10% of the population now says that they are LGBT up from like half of that in 2017. Right. Right. What's going on with the, you know, with an interest in trans, being trans, um, do you think it is that people are, there are more trans people now, or is this all kind yeah. of a rhetorical gesture? And how do you deal with this? Yeah, well, we don't know for sure because it's so new. Yeah. Uh, what is the normal background rate of gender dysphoria where you feel mm -hmm. like from a very young age that you were born in the wrong body? Mm -hmm. Now, before recently, it was like maybe one tenth of one percent or, right. or, or even less, a twentieth of one percent, just vanishingly small. And now all of a sudden you have, you know, these spikes of like 4,000% increase in this mm -hmm. one age cohort, like age 14 to 19, you mm -hmm. know, that kind of thing. And so that would suggest the social contagion hypothesis. Mm -hmm. That is, it spreads amongst a community of people that are either in the same classroom mm -hmm. in school or they're on an online community. And they get a lot of social proof and positive feedback if they say, I'm this. Right. Um, you know, I'm bi, I'm pan, I'm whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a student a couple, of, two years ago, uh, who in the middle of class, and, and this was a small seminar, so we talked a lot. And she said, I've decided I'm a boy. This is what I feel like now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a man. And she changed her name, and everybody called her the name, including me. Yep. Cut her hair, changed her clothes, and so on. And and then, but but in the conversations that ensued, it was clear to me she doesn't want to be a man. She wants to be trans. Mm -hmm. That's the thing to be, and right. in the moment you announce that, it's like, oh my God, what's that? And you know, a mm -hmm. thousand questions from yep. the other students, and it's like, I see. So now the other hypothesis is that society's become more liberal, tolerant, mm -hmm. open, so more people are coming out. Right now, that is true with the, with the, I think gays and lesbians. Mm -hmm. Although now we're having a backlash, say some lesbians and, and gays that you know where are all the lesbians now? And right. their concern, and I agree, this is a concern is that what if you're a 13, 14 year old young uh, man or a young boy and you find yourself attracted to other boys and somebody tells you that's because inside you're a girl, you're mm -hmm. not actually gay. Right. When in fact, th this person's most likely going to grow up to be gay, which is now okay. That's right. accepted, right? Now, another thing I've been thinking about is, is it that because the LGBTQ or the gay marriage, same sex marriage thing happened so fast, mm -hmm. you know, from 2011 when the majority of Americans finally tipped over to above 50% in support to 2015, the uh, Supreme Court decision to make it the law of the land. That was pretty fast. That's probably the mm -hmm. fastest rights revolution ever. So it could be the next, you know, sort of cohort. It's like, well, what are we going to champion? Mm -hmm. You know, what's next? You know, there's animal rights. But there's gender rights, and mm -hmm. so LGBTQ is one thing. So, so the focus has primarily been about who you are attracted to, mm -hmm. and that used to be uh, against the law. You can't be attracted to same-sex people. Right. You can't have sex with them. That was illegal. People were fired in the government. You know? yeah, yeah. Thousands were fired for that, mm -hmm. and now that's okay. So they've kind of shifted it to, okay, what about who you identify as, mm -hmm. men or women? That's kind of become maybe the next rights revolution and people again they want to be engaged in something that's meaningful in life there's a next rights revolution mm -hmm. there and i'm going to go for that in um you know when we were younger and i'm thinking in the 70s and whatnot being trans and it was back then it was uh, short for transsexual and it always implied surgical like gender reassignment surgery and i'm thinking mm -hmm. of people like the tennis player renee richards mm -hmm. who had been richard raskin i believe mm -hmm. um, who joined the ladies professional tennis tour but it was very much about you know physicality i mean obviously there were hormone treatments and things like that but it was like if you were a man and you wanted to become a woman you got the surgery and that's right. what defined it and you were saying before that like the equipment isn't necessarily the definition of being male or female right today's trans it seems to be much more about performing a kind of uh, almost public sexuality yes right, how does that right. yeah how does that factor into any of this? I, well again i think that supports the social contagion hypothesis mm -hmm. the whole point of doing it is to make it public or else why would you do it 
Hmm. Whereas before it was, you know, a private thing, except for the, the like public uh, uh, figures like Rene Richards. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, this is just something you do because that's what you need to do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, our mutual friend, Deidre McCluskey, mm -hmm. you know, was Donald McCluskey and transitioned to great cost to her personal life. Yeah. This wasn't like she's she getting love bombed by everybody. Yeah. Quite the contrary. And did it anyway. Right. And still does it because that's who she is. Right. Okay. That exists. That's a real thing. Yeah. But is it true that, I mean, I've, I've been hearing stories and reading accounts where, you know, like half the class or a quarter of the class of a high school class says mm -hmm. I'm trans or bi or pan or you know, right. there's something. So it, it also looks like being cisgender straight is about the boringest thing you could be. Right. And you don't want to be that. And I actually, a number of uh, gay and lesbian friends of mine, so, you know, they like gay men, white gay men feel like they are even more square than heterosexuals right. because heterosexuals are talking about kinks and poly and right. stuff like that <laughs> right. and lesbians yeah there is you know because lesbians have always been a smaller percentage of the population yeah. and i know people like abigail schreier who i've talked to i know you have uh who's quite controversial in a lot of things but she argues that uh, particularly girls who would grow up to be lesbian their parents i mean this is kind of a complicated argument but i i kind of buy into it that their parents are actually almost homophobic and they would rather that their child be mm, trans right. than to be right. lesbian, which seem I mean, I guess what I'm asking you uh, is, I mean, you have witnessed and participated in like this vast kind of rights revolution over the past 50 years where society is so much more profoundly libertarian mm -hmm. than we could have imagined, yeah. in, you know, in the bicentennial. Uh, you know, and, and I picked that not because of bi, but it's just because it's like 76, <laughs> right? Funny. But it's like you can, you know, you can be gay, you can be straight, you can be anything. And it does not seem to be an impediment to any kind of social success, any kind of professional success. Yeah. So that's progress, right? It really is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, you know, just from a scientist's perspective, what is the real number? Yeah. Um, and we don't know. But right. I suspect that the current numbers we're seeing now are greatly exaggerated. I mean, back when the Kinsey report came out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he reported what 10 percent uh, right. of, of uh, guys are gay. Right. And, a, and I, I mean, a, which in a study that was clearly poorly designed, yes, right, yeah, or yeah, kind yeah, of right. like cooked data in yeah, a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the real number is probably something like three to five percent. And then mm -hmm. it's also curious to know what. Why are there not as many lesbians? It looks mm -hmm. like maybe the, uh, how many lesbians are is like half of how many gay guys mm -hmm. there are. Why is that? You know, that, that could be some social yeah. uh, aspect. How much, uh, 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 this is kind of a bizarre question, but um, we are at Freedom Fest, so we can talk about whatever we want. Yeah, but right. how, how much of sexual orientation do you think is kind of baked in, um, you know, when you come out of the uh, womb, or, you know, and how much of it is susceptible to kind of social influence? Well, I, th I think most of it's baked in mm -hmm. biologically, genetically, uh, you know, in the womb, chemistry and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, after that, of course, it can be tweaked a little bit, mm -hmm. but, you know, the vast majority of people that identify you know, are cisgender, most of them you know, cisgender. Right. And yes, yeah, society could, you know, the, you know, the whole blue and pink thing that used to be reversed like a century and a half ago, I forget, maybe like 1890s or something, you know, the, the, the blue and pink thing was, was different than it is now. So to and what by that, you mean pink was associated with men and, yes, and blue right. was, yeah. yeah. I forget why that was, but in, mm. in any case, it, but it's not like the colors of the toys are going to make right. the little boy more masculine. Or we've all seen the pictures of Hemingway in a dress as <laughs> right, a kid, yeah, right, and it's right. like his latent homosexuality yeah, had right. nothing to do with the way he was raised, right, right, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do think the born this way. I think mm. the the, inter the other interesting thing about the current trans movement is that the gay community fought for decades that it for a kind of biological determinism. Mm -hmm. I was born this way. It's not a lifestyle choice. Your little reparative pro, uh, programs are not going to work. You right. can't deconvert me. If I just had the right woman, then I would know, you know, how to yeah. be straight or anything like that. So, uh, and, and, and the reason for that also is that if you're born that way, then you're a protected class, your right. rights stand. But now the trans movement seems to be saying you can be anything you want anytime you want you can mm -hmm. change from day to day you can change genders you know you can change who you're attracted to it's totally fluid 
And that's actually scary for gays because it's like, well, hang on. Now we're going to get mm -hmm. pushed back from the conservatives. They're going to go, oh, so right. you and aren't that born that way. In that case, we can fix you. And all of this exists in, when we're talking about rights uh, or the individual's relationship to government or something is totally separate. Like, so, I mean, because regardless of what, why people are trans or identify as trans or gay or straight or whatever, it doesn't, that doesn't imply the government should discriminate against them in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, of course, right. Trans rights are human rights, absolutely. You should not be fired for being trans. I mean, if that's yeah. the only reason, then, then no, for the same reason. Gay shouldn't have been fired decades ago. What is, um, with trans athletes, you, you've written about um, this, and you know, what is, you know, on a certain level, and particularly at the highest levels possible, when we're talking about Olympic athletes or NCAA athletes or something, it, you know, it's such a small number of people, right. it almost seems wrong to be looking at that and then kind of generalizing backwards, because by definition, these people are extreme outliers in performance yes, and everything. Yes. But how do you, yeah. you know, what, what is your sense of like, what is fair for, you know, trans athletes competing against, uh, you know, biological male or female? Well, so if you're born male, and you go through puberty, there are so many changes that are substantive if you compare to female body development in puberty. After that's happened, uh, and, and the international swimming body just made this decision based on that argument that it's too late. There's no amount of testosterone suppression you're going to mm -hmm. take to even the playing field with the average amount of testosterone that men have versus women, if we could just lower those. After puberty, it's too late. I mean, mm -hmm. all the big changes have been made. The bones are bigger and denser. The, the sinews and muscles and ligaments and tendons are all different. The VO2 uptake for your lungs, your oxygen capacity, and on and on and on. It's just mm -hmm. like a thousand different differences. And now it's true, there are, you know, again, two overlapping sets. There are some women who are much more physically strong and so on yeah. than some men, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, kind of the average, mm. the two means. Although sometimes they get kicked out of Olymp, uh, you know, uh, say uh, track and field and things like that. Yes, There's, well, you know, the you know Easter, where people have these naturally- These dopers. Well, those were dopers, right? Yeah. But, um, but, but uh, is Casper, this not the same? Um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on her name now, the South African runner who's, oh, a, right. who's a woman uh, or is always identified as a woman and who's fantastic, but has elevated levels of testosterone right. and other things, right. can't compete internationally unless she reduces that. And right. Is that fair? I mean, it might be that you need to have some kind of system. Set you have up, to but... draw the line somewhere, right? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, so yeah. on average, there's a pretty vast difference between average testosterone levels. And mm -hmm. it's not just testosterone, but that's yeah. kind of the big one, right? So you're going to have, but you have two overlapping bell curves. Mm -hmm. So some of the higher women are going to be higher than some of the lower men. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, and so then you have to make it, so the outliers, well, this woman is right up against the upper limit and mm -hmm. well, okay. And so this is the rule we made. So we right. gotta, you know, apply Should it Should we be looking in a uh, at a world beyond what, well, like why do we have male and female sports competitions? Well, because if we didn't, there'd be no women in sports. Yeah. You know, I mean, there just wouldn't. Well, you are stepping in it everywhere. <laughs> You're like sideshow Bob hitting rakes have, have, everywhere have you, you seen, go. Have so. you seen the doubles match in tennis where mm -hmm. I think it's Federer and Nadal on opposite sides yeah. and each of them has a, a, a top woman. I think mm -hmm. one of them was the, was the Williams sisters and one of the other top ones. And the women can't even get a racket on the male serve. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can't, I mean, they're like diving and yeah, rolling yeah. on the grass and they can't even hit it. Mm -hmm. That's what would happen. There would be no women players at all. Mm -hmm. That would be the end of women's sports. Yeah. That's just the way it is. That's mm -hmm. reality. <laughs> you know, I'm not talking about chess or something like this, right. but these physical sports like that. You know, when I was directing Race Across America in the 90s. Uh, explain what that was, because yeah, that's a phenomenal kind of event, which, <laughs> yes. it, yeah, it's, it's, it's worth rehearsing. Yeah, so in November. 1982, me and three other guys started this race called uh, Great American Bike Race, later changed to Race Across America, mm -hmm. RAM. So this is a nonstop coast-to-coast -coast race. Uh, each rider, a cyclist, has a support crew that follows them. You, it, the clock starts and, it, and stops when you're done. And so you can skip sleep or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so this was because it was 
the Reagan eighties, we were all worried about <laughs> nuclear annihilation and we were coked out of our minds. Right. So we were right. just going to ride our bikes across America. And this is the rise of the yeah. Ironman triathlon yeah. and the Iditarod yeah. dog sled race. Mm -hmm. Let's just go crazy. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So but by the night, of course we had women right away enter yeah. the race and we had a women's division and a women's prize and plaques and rings mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And, uh, but in, in 93 and 94, I had, when I was race director, I had two women, uh, Shauna Hogan and Muffy Ritz, who were better than all of the men for the first thousand miles, all mm -hmm. the way into Colorado. And, uh, and and there was talk like, well, uh, maybe a woman could win the right. race, right? And, and I, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, I think it was the anthropologist Ashley Montague at various points in the early 70s hypothesized that women uh, were designed by evolution to be better ultra marathoners right, than men, right. which yes. kind of has, it, it's kind of true. And the longer people race, gender falls apart. It falls, right, it becomes right. less important, but you're continuing. It, it, if it's, yeah, but not say something like a high speed race. Right. Like a Tour de France stage is pretty long, but, yeah. uh, but women wouldn't last, you know, the first yeah. 20 minutes. So what happened in, uh, <laughs> in so they're, case, they're leading it up yeah, through Colorado yeah. and then what happened? Yeah. What yeah. happened? Well, she got caught and then, you know, finished over a day behind the, the winning men. Mm -hmm. At the winning two or three men beater, and it's just strength. It ultimately, it's just every little bit of difference mm -hmm. in the bodies uh, that it just made a difference over ten, to, uh, nine days rather than the first three days. Yeah. So you know, and I, but I even asked the women, you know, would you like a, a just have one division and you compete against the men? No, no, yeah. no, because it's not fair, right? The guys are just on average so, to be stronger. Let me go back to something we were talking about at the start of this. Um, about you know, there seems to be a tendency. Eo Wilson was a you know a conventional liberal um yes. you know and towards the end of his life he, you know he's very big on things like uh, climate change and all of that like he subscribed to a lot of you know kind of bromides of progressive liberal policy um but within the concept of sociobiology and whatnot there does seem to be a real tension on you know broadly on the left where it's like we we can create the world however we want to like we believe in evolution mm -hmm. because we believe in science and we are not those rubes in Arkansas, you know, who are Christian, who are biblical literalists and reject science. We believe in science. But then, you know, Wilson's theories kind of suggest that, no, like if you take evolution seriously, there are going to be limits on how much you can engineer yes, humanity. Yes, right. And there are going to be different groups even will select for different properties and characteristics that are going to have real world outcomes. Yeah. Um, is that a tension within yeah. kind of the science community and either the right or the left? Well, yes, but but Pinker points out in the, his book, The Blank Slate, that mm -hmm. in fact, the opposite is true, that uh, of course, um, biology and genetics is part of it. The environment can't operate on nothing. It has mm -hmm. to operate on a physical system, mm -hmm. which is the brain, which is designed by your genes because right. they're made of proteins. And so it's not possible that it can't have any effect. And so you have to understand what the effects are before you can re-engineer society mm -hmm. to make it fair. You know, Thomas Sowell uh, wrote a book about this, this you know, kind of conflicting worldviews and that mm -hmm. this kind of utopian worldview where it's all blank slates and we can re-engineer society to make it perfectly equal. Right will always fail because we're not perfectly equal. Mm -hmm. You know, we have different interests, different physical characteristics and skills and so on. Well, that's just the way it is. So, so there you need kind of a, a more general principle that says wherever you fall on the bell curve of whatever it is we're measuring, uh, you should have the opportunity to do whatever it is you want mm -hmm. without any, any barriers based on these protected classes that you didn't choose, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of a Rawlsian argument. You don't know which, what your running speed is going to be or what your IQ is going to mm -hmm. be. So we have to make it fair that there, you have access to all the different jobs and the chips fall where they may. Wilson, at the end of his life, in a, maybe the last decade or so, endorsed group selection. Mm. Now, group selection... Uh, it, it is is more supported by liberals in the left mm -hmm. because it's this idea that you know we as a group can, can can be the target of selection and make things happen that the individual can't. Now most evolutionary biologists, people like Dawkins and Pinker, say no, this is not true. There's right. no evidence for this, and you know it's still the individual 
genome of the individual is the one that is the target of natural selection. Yeah. But I just thought that was interesting toward the end of his life. It was a more liberal kind of argument he was making and, there. I mean, Stephen Jay Gould was, I, I guess what I'm getting at is that you science, I, I mean, people, and maybe it's libertarians or scientists, want to believe that I am arguing from science and reality into my politics, but mm. are the, perhaps these are separate spheres. Not necessarily. I'm willing, okay, yeah. I'm willing to uh, you know, leap over uh, Hume's wall, separating is and ought. Mm -hmm. We do it all the time. I mean, the way things are, we have to structure society in a way based on human nature. Mm. And again, just fairness should be our, our goal. Why, um, why fairness? Well, again, kind of a Rawlsian yeah. argument that you don't know where you're going to be. So right. we, we have to make it as fair as possible. And then you do whatever you want. And mm -hmm. we're not going to have equal outcomes. This is the problem today is that, yeah. you know, the drive toward equal outcomes. No, no, because mm -hmm. <laughs> we're never going to get equal outcomes yeah. uh, just for a thousand different reasons. So just equal opportunities is the goal. Mm -hmm. Um but uh, yeah, anyway, so, but <laughs> yeah, so there is a tension in people like Gould and Wilson on, on the left about, well, what about genetics? This is just a misunderstanding, mm -hmm. it says Pinker, and I agree with him that, you know, you, you're just misreading this thing. Like it, if it's genetic, you can't change it. No, in fact, that, that, that's not true. Right. right? Um, let's talk about gun control because you've written, and this is probably one of the issues where you depart most from a kind of libertar libertarian guess, yeah. orthodoxy, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, you you believe in gun control, um, and can you make the brief case for that? And you know why why do libertarian or maybe not libertarians? Let's say Second Amendment fundamentalists. In your phrase, where are they wrong? Well, so you know, society is filled with collective action problems we need to solve as a group, and to do that, you have to get uh, you know a majority, and then they all have to chip in, like paying taxes again. Mm -hmm. It's just most libertarians are not anarchists, and they agree. Okay, we need property rights and therefore we have to have a court system to support your property mm -hmm. rights and we need a police force and the prison system and a, a military all of a sudden you have a big government that right. you got to fund with taxes all right how is this any different why is guns mm -hmm. separate in my opinion it's because guns are almost totemic as a proxy for something else this kind of um, focus on individual autonomy freedom self-defense mm -hmm. liberty uh, freedom from the government that sort of thing over and above all the other concessions you've already made, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know okay, I'm going to pay for police and fire and military and so on. And, uh, I, I, and if I don't pay my taxes, they're coming mm -hmm. to get me at some point, I'll get the letters and then, you know, and so forth. But eventually men with guns will come to your house. Yeah. Right. Why what, you've signed on for that, you know, right. so, so but gun, I think that's why they want the guns because well, then they can I, fight well, back. I know, but, right? Yeah. But why would, okay. So, yeah, right. Yeah. So, but why would you support that? Because you've already agreed that, well, we need somebody to protect our, my property rights mm -hmm. through a court system that I'm willing to pay for. Well, how about the guy over there? He doesn't want to pay for mm -hmm. it. Well, then send men with guns over there and he has guns. You know, this, this leads, in a way, this kind of fanaticism about just arm everybody, mm -hmm. um, you know, is a way of saying the United States is a failed state. Uh, and and it's just everybody's on their own and we don't really trust the police or the military to do their job mm -hmm. We don't trust our institutions. We give up. It's like we're living in Somalia Well, no, we're not living in mm -hmm. Somalia I can see if you live there why well, you'd want a gun or something and and I do get that You know if I if, if I'm an african-american living in an inner city and I don't trust the police because they're not trustworthy And they can't get there in time. I mm -hmm. and there's violence around me. I should have a gun So I'm of, you know, again not binary. You know, I'm not anti-gun mm -hmm. at all. I grew up with guns my stepfather was a hunter so i had a bb gun and a pellet gun and then a 20 gauge shotgun and then a 12 gauge shotgun and for 20 years i had a handgun in my house in altadena and uh you know but uh, it's just we're facing a social problem how do we solve it the carnage is you know more people die by guns than, than by cars and is that i mean one of the things that is is true i mean gun homicides have been going down you know since the mid 90s so there's right. slight upticks and things like that but the suicides Yes. You know, I mean, that's like more than half of gun deaths, right? Yes. So that's part of what yes. your argument yes. is, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So how about just uh, how about just regulation in the form of more better background checks, right? And mm -hmm. we already have laws about um, you know men with restraining orders against their significant other. Mm -hmm. I mean, when a woman is murdered, it's uh, I think it's like ninety percent of it is by um, mm -hmm. a significant other in, in, after they broke up or got divorced or child custody issues, something like that. Uh, you know, why have the gun there? If, if he already has a restraining order, he can't buy a gun. 
You know, a lot of those laws are already in place. Just enforce them. You know, the, the gun show loophole. Are Why you not sympathetic them? to the argument that, yeah, I mean, this is the point. We have tons of gun laws and they don't seem know, to be, know. you know, they're in the same way that we, you know, you can't be utopian about certain things like school shootings are horrible, but they are rare, not yeah. the... Yeah. They're not, they, the they're not yeah. common enough where that's where you I make know. all the laws. To be based honest, on Matt, I, I'm ready to give up on the whole thing and just say, if I get, I mean, it's just, just let everybody, everybody have their guns because there's already 400 million guns, right? right. 120 guns for every 100 people. Yeah. Right? So we're talking about 400 million guns in America. We're not going to get them back. Yeah. You know, if the government said we're doing a buyback or a take back program, it'd be like Waco every day. Yeah. <laughs> Ruby Ridge. Wait, every it's, day. it's fascinating, too, that actually as more guns are in circulation, it's in a fewer percentage of households, which so it's right. so fewer people are right. having are owning more guns. And yeah. I'm not I'm not I, I'm not particularly, um, you know, focus on the gun issue, but that seems like an interesting social change. Right, right. And I'm not sure what accounts for it or if that's good or bad or yeah, different. But. Yeah. You know, and the examples that I use, everybody uses, you know, Austria and Australia, other countries have done mm -hmm. these things and it worked. Yeah, but they're smaller, homogeneous mm -hmm. population. They didn't have very many guns in the first place. They don't have the same yeah. culture that we have about guns, Second Amendment, all that. I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know what mm -hmm. the solution is. It seems like Somebody should do something, and I know how libertarians respond to that. Yeah, the yeah. government. We don't want the government to do more. Yeah. It's already doing too much. Okay. But again, like back to the analogy with cars, pretty much everybody signed off in the idea, well, cars should be regulated. Mm -hmm. You know, seatbelts are good, and airbags are good. And, you know, the, even though the number of car deaths still hovers like 35 to 40,000 a year, but, but but if you adjust it by the miles driven, mm -hmm. cars are much safer now right. than they used to be. And why is that government regulation? You have to have oh, seatbelts. You're speaking heresy now. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, that, I know. That government can I don't never think do that, anything I, good. I don't see how that would have happened just by private enterprise. Yeah, yeah. Right? that's. I mean, that's a it's a serious challenge to a kind of knee jerk libertarianism, which I I think. You know, people who still call themselves libertarians like myself, I need to take up that mantle. And sometimes I can and sometimes I right. can't. Yeah. Um, I mean, but just one last point, yeah. the collective action problem, like the motorcycle helmet thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and back when that happened, uh, you know, libertarians, a lot of motorcycle, I'm not going to do it. Right. Or they would wear these, you know, little nothing helmets. You know, I get that. Yeah. I totally get that. But, you know, the way our medical system operates eventually uh, you know you and i are going to have to pay for these hmm. accidents and these head injuries do you i'm assuming you grew up riding bicycles without helmets oh, and yes, then yes, when yes. did you start uh, when you were a bike racer you yes helmets, well that but, happened in the actually but are and really, are they effective at yes all? the current okay. helmets are totally okay. effective yes because they're designed on based on um, motorcycle helmet design mm -hmm. it's a it's a compressed polystyrene mm -hmm. Um, a shell that on impact it absorbs like ninety five percent of the mm -hmm. impact, and they work. The bike helmets before that, and these the, are the old leather leather hair strap nets, ones, completely yeah, worthless. Yeah. Oh, yeah. At the at the gun show when I worked for at the bike show when I worked yeah. for Bell Helmets, they were one of my sponsors. We used to take one of those leather hair nets and and have a, the people come by. Okay, put your fist inside there. Yeah. yeah now slam it against that brick wall. Like, yeah. no, I'm not. Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. Now do it with one of these helmets, no problem. Right. Right. It's like, that's your head, right? But was that, you know, was that innovation driven by superior technology and information or was it by mandate? This is, well, by mandate because uh, enough people were died in the Tour de France mm -hmm. from head injuries that the tour itself said, hey, we, we need to mandate helmets. So, and when I was working for Bell at the time, they were mm -hmm. saying, they already had the Bell shell, which was this mm -hmm. white geeky looking helmet. And it, they've had this for like 15 years. No one was buying it. No mm -hmm. one, serious cyclists, would not wear it. So I said, you need to design it to look like a leather hairnet. So it's got to be black and, yeah. you know, thin with yeah, some right, air right. Yeah, some yeah. air vents and, and maybe a little gold trim. It's got to look cool. And you got to get pros to, right. to, to wear it and the people go oh all right you know and that helped but it wasn't until it was mandated mm -hmm. and, and th again this collective action problem most most cyclists wanted to wear helmets because they know it's safer right but when some of them don't wear it they get a slight advantage it's like well i gotta it's like doping like right. i gotta do it because that guy's doing it yeah right and, and then once it's mandated okay no one gets to take the drug everyone has to wear a helmet and it's like okay good i want to <laughs> take you down a slight detour now that we're talking about the tour de france and also about technology and innovation and doping and things like that 
Uh, Greg LeMond was the first American to win the Tour de France, and he's like a fascinating figure who also mm -hmm. embraced every technological innovation he could. And there was mm -hmm. one Tour de France in particular where he beat Laurent Fignon, mm -hmm. who eschewed technology. It was like, oh, that's like American <laughs> stupidity and things right. like that. Lost by seconds over Eight you know seconds, a, tw yeah. a twenty one day you yeah. know yeah. race. Um, how important is uh, you know our um, is like understanding technology and innovation and kind of pushing that forward? How you know how is the best way to make that happen or, or more people embrace that? Uh, well, it happens naturally. It kind of trickles down from the mm -hmm. pro ranks to serious uh, you know weekend athletes mm -hmm. and. People have more money now, and the bikes are better than they used to be. Yeah. They really do get better. Like, I get a new bike every three to four years, and it's, they, every one of them is really better than the previous yeah. one. You know, maybe just a little bit, just 1%, mm -hmm. 2%, but you can feel the difference. And, you know, disc brakes instead of the rim brakes, they're better. Electronic shifting is better. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and and it just kind of starts to add up, but because the market, because of capitalism, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, what would have been say a fifteen twenty thousand dollar bike, I could get for like sixty five hundred now, mm -hmm. because so many people are buying them because they really are better, and you see all the pros racing them. Do you think this is part of the problem of our current moment? Uh, and now I'm leaping from kind of technological innovation and bike racing or something to in general. I mean, the world is so much better than it was 50 years ago, yeah. but we don't seem to want to recognize that or acknowledge that. And well, you is don't that see a it. It's hard to see because yeah. it happens slow enough. Like again, the bike thing. You know, it's if if I was a regular weekend warrior or whatever, and maybe yeah. I'd buy a bike every 10 years, and then, oh, okay, I really see it. But when you buy them incrementally, it's like watching your kid grow. It's, yeah, you see the pictures from three years ago. Oh, wow, he got mm -hmm. big. You don't notice it. Right. And, you know, that's uh, that's hard to see. You know, Pinker talks about that. And uh, and Matt Ridley does, you know, mm -hmm. you know, you know, just the cost of how many hours a week you, uh, you have to work to get your dinner or your mm -hmm. light. You know, Matt has those charts. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wow. I mean, it's just just very incrementally, very slowly mm -hmm. over decades and centuries. And, you know, from day to day, we don't see that because our senses are geared to immediate environment, you know, the next day, the next week, that's mm -hmm. about it. That's all we care about because we're really designed to pay attention to threats. So the negativity bias. So we focus on bad things rather than the mm -hmm. good things and also immediate threats. And, and the way the world works because of second law and entropy is that, you know, good things happen mostly very gradually, slowly over long periods of time, but bad things can happen. Boom. Right. You know, you get the stroke or the heart attack or the company goes out of business, or the stock collapses, the country falls. These things happen very quickly. So our, we're tuned to looking for those kind of threats because mm -hmm. those are the things that took us out. Yeah. Um, just to close out the Tour de France, um, you know, beginning with Le Monde and going through Lance Armstrong, uh, this to me, I found it interesting that, you know, Americans didn't care about bike racing. It was it was like ridiculously yes. European and all right. of that. And it was kind of like soccer in the 70s and 80s. It like picked up. And then Lance Armstrong and, you know, and, and people, af Americans after him who were caught doping and cheating and whatnot after protesting that they hadn't. Um, you know, now we don't care about bike racing in the same way, right? right? And is that, you know, has that happened all over society? Where I mean, we live in an era now, things are getting better and better, but our trust and confidence in institutions and in society have been declining. Um, yeah. You know, what? How do we, how do we deal with that kind of hmm. uh, dynamic? Yeah, interesting analogy. Yeah, well, there are Americans in the tour this year, yeah. uh, but they're not doing that well. I'm mean, right. just kind of in the middle. It so. definitely punctured the, I mean, yeah. there was a growing interest in things like professional cycling and, and certainly the tour. That, yeah. You know, and I guess, and, and it's even broader than, you know, just America. I mean, the, the revelation of, you know, profound doping, which in a way goes back to the very early beginning of the tour. There were doping yeah. controversies yeah. very from the beginning. And I'm kind of big on performance enhancing drugs. I kind of, you know, I don't... <laughs> Just let everybody do it. <laughs> well, or yeah, I mean, but then you do have rules and the, but you know, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm with you on that. I mean, I, I guess if it didn't trickle down to junior uh, athletes mm -hmm. that are up and coming, 
and you get that again that you get that kind of collective action problem and like well i don't want to do it but that guy's doing it mm -hmm. and i want to get to his level and so on and that's how it happens that's how it happened with lance i mean it's unfortunate he was not able to articulate that very clearly on oprah's couch there mm -hmm. um that you know when he didn't start any of this he just did it better than everybody else was doing it and he yeah. hired the the top guy and said you can't work for anybody else mm -hmm. i'll give you a pile of money to for an exclusive and um and, and, you know, but there's, you know, it, when he was first starting and he was getting his ass kicked and, you know, it's like, why is this happening? And somebody said, see mm -hmm. that guy there and that guy there, they're, they're doping. They're using this, mm -hmm. they're using that. They're going to that guy over there. He's the top doping. Doc oh, okay. And then if, uh, so here's the choice. I, I, I either do it or I, I'm out. Right. right. And then, you know, you, you don't get to fulfill your dream. So they do it. You know, it's a, it's a rational choice, I think. And there's, I mean, I guess in, in humans, would you say in evolution, there's this, there are these two tendencies. One is that we want excellence, but then we also, and we're willing to do almost anything for it, but then we are very disappointed, if not in ourselves and our heroes, when they actually do what we're kind of urging them to do, which is... Take, you know, pay any price in order to become right, the best at right, something. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure you have to put it at such extremes, though, because you yeah, have sure. just spectacular performances that you, where you don't need the drugs, maybe. Mm -hmm. But again, you just have to you have to have good enforcement. I mean, uh, there was an interesting thing when Rafa won the uh, French Open this year, mm -hmm. and then it came out like a week later that his he, his foot was all shot up with all kinds of mm -hmm. drugs and stuff because he has some weird problem there. And a couple of cyclists were commenting, "Boy, if we did that, we'd be right. kicked out and we'd be shamed and and, and yeah. humiliated in the front pages." of the newspapers like, and it on. is true the doping agencies like the you know that govern sports are terrible and yes. very arbitrary and just right. incompetent i mean in in many ways and i can recall olympic swimmers you know uh, losing their gold medals because they had taken the wrong kind of cold medication right, or whatever right, yeah. and, whereas the nfl you know their program was um, you know, you have to, the doping agency has to contact the player's agent right. and then set a date to test yeah, yeah. him like in three weeks. Okay, right. no problem. Yeah, <laughs> we'll yeah. clear it all out. <laughs> um, let's uh, close up by talking about Skeptic, uh, the Skeptic Society, Skeptic Magazine, 30 years and running. Um, you know, explain what the Skeptic Society is about. Well, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Science education is our yeah. thing, critical thinking, rationality, you mm -hmm. know, reason. Um, that they're, you know, a commitment to universal realism. There is a reality. We can know something about it, albeit not perfectly. You know, that kind of enlightenment ideals of the search for objective truth mm -hmm. uh, through tried and true methods. You know, that's kind of our, our thing. Yeah. And just we just try to tackle subjects that are important. You know? Right. And as you see with the abortion issue, trans right. issue, next one on race, you know, we've already done astrology, Bigfoot, UFOs. You right, know, right. You can only do those things so much. Yeah. And it's like, okay, we, we pretty much know what the story is there. Let's find It's amazing here. how the Loch Ness Monster and the Bermuda Triangle, just people don't care about those anymore. No, I know they're out, but, but, that, but yeah. the UFOs are back because of the UAP Absolutely, thing. yeah. <laughs> but, and uh, although it seems like this is the end of UFOs, right? Like it's obvious that it's, you know, it's not extraterrestrial. It should right? be obvious um, to everybody, although it's it's still pretty popular that Ancient Alien Show yeah, yeah. is on its 18th season. I wow, mean, that's great. I mean, how it's many... up there with The Apprentice or something, <laughs> yeah. right? But so I want to ask you: Is this a good time to be a skeptic um, in terms of like, does rationality and and again, understanding that it's imperfect, we all have you know our cognitive bias and all of that kind of stuff. Is there more broadly speaking, are we more rational than we were 50 years ago, or is mm. that never the way to really think about this things? Is a, this, is, this is a big debate in cognitive psych circles of to what extent are we naturally gullible and we fall for things mm -hmm. like cults and scams, things like that, because people do fall for those things. Mm -hmm. But the counter argument to that is, in fact, most people don't fall for cults and scams. Mm -hmm. The reason these scammers have to send out uh, you know, a million emails to get mm -hmm. one sucker is because most people are not suckers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, most people who join religious sects and groups and self-help groups and they go to Tony Robbins' you know, weekend, they, they, they're, they're not joining cults. And mm -hmm. if the thing turned into a cult, they probably would leave, right? Is so we only hear there's an availability heuristic. We only hear about the ones, you know, the Jonestown and, mm -hmm. and Waco and you know, sort of the crazy ones, the, the um, you know, Heaven's Gate. But those are really rare, right? Mm. And so I've been thinking about this um, 
you know, to what extent this is called default to truth? You know, when when you tell me something, I just tend to believe you because I because I know you. Mm-hmm. I, I don't have time to fact check everything right. you tell me. So there's kind of a social trust that most of the time works, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I was ju- just telling people about the story I read of this guy, a cyclist, who, uh, do you know what Strava is? You know, you post your rides yeah. on this app. And then on Strava, there's these King of the Mountain, KOM. Every segment is timed. And, you know, there's thousands of people have yeah. done that segment. And you can see what the average speed was. You try to go out there and break mm-hmm. that guy's time or whatever. Well, so there was this guy who... Turns out he was like a total con man, fraud, you know, uh, an impersonator. I mean, he said he had, he was a CEO of a major corporation. He had been in IPO startups and he was in special forces and on and on and on. Yeah. And he was a professional bike racer on this European team. And, 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 and so the people, wherever he was living in California, I think, you know, no one bothered to check until he posted a time on a Strava KOM yeah. that somebody saw and went, that's not possible. The yeah. speed was like what a top U- European pro would do. And this guy's like 45 years old. It's like, yeah. ah, wait a minute. I'm going to look into what else he's done, right? But but if I just heard, you know, I was in the special forces. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't even know how to check if you told right. me that. Like, who would I call? Does he, was, you know, Nick really a Navy SEAL guy? Right. I wouldn't even know, right? So I think for the most part, we're not gullible so much as the trust thing works pretty well most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but evolution did not eliminate all the psychopaths and the free riders and Mm -hmm. the liars and the deceivers and the cheaters because that would take too much energy to get rid of every last one, right? So Mm -hmm. a society can tolerate like a small percentage of of con men Mm -hmm. and liars and cheaters and thieves and so on and still function reasonably well. What's your favorite cult? (laughs) Um, Well, I guess... This is going to sound crazy. The cult of Trump at the moment. Yeah. I mean, I really think it is something like that. You know, the, just even just yesterday, just after the latest uh, January 6th hearings, where it's obvious to anyone with eyes and ears that, you know, he knew he lost and he was just a naked grab for power. And you still see some of these Republican I mean, you have, toadies. Uh, uh, yeah, tons of Republicans, uh, people running for office saying that this, the right. election was stolen. Right now, it could be they're just opportunists saying, I I got to say whatever mm-hmm. I think the boss wants me to say so that he gives me his endorsement so I can win the election. I don't really believe it. That's possible. But what concerns me is that, you know, like 60 percent of self-identified Republicans say they and they have nothing to gain. They just. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I think there was I think rigged. Right. Yeah. I think it was rigged. That's a kind of conspiracy theory and, and maybe even a cult. That's not on the fringe. So what's the you know mm. what's the status of skepticism? It's more important than ever, because you know most of these conspiracy theories that I've used to deal with, you know the JFK or nine mm-hmm. eleven, they're pretty fringy, right? Mm-hmm. And this one is you know right there at the top of the government, mm-hmm. and uh, but you know I'm worried this could threaten our democracy, right? Mm-hmm. If enough people believe this, they won't accept the outcome of the next yeah. election. Do you worry going into the midterms, by all accounts, the Democrats are going to lose big for a variety of historical yeah. reasons? Yeah. The president, when the president is unpopular in his first midterm election, they you know he loses 25 yeah. to 35 seats, et cetera. Right. Democrats are already starting to rehearse how these elections, you know, the Supreme Court is not legitimate. The Republicans have stripped people of voting rights all over the place. Do you right. worry that? I do. So we're going to go from a right-wing conspiracy theory about Ill- illegitimate elections to a Democratic one. Yes. Well, the the Dems have always had conspiracy theories whenever mm-hmm. they lost. If you just go back to the last fifty years in every election, mm-hmm. uh, this one was slightly different because <laughs> it ended up at the Capitol. Yeah. But uh, but yes, of course they're they're going to. I'm worried that if a Republican genuinely wins say in 24, whoever mm-hmm. it is, maybe DeSantis, hopefully not Trump, uh, that the Dems won't accept it. They'll just say, yeah. nah, we know they, they were doing this behind the scenes and mm-hmm. the gerrymandering and this and that. This was all illegal. And and then what? You know, then we're in trouble. Well, although I suspect Skeptic uh, Magazine's circulation is going to go up. <laughs> I don't know. But where you, or it's going to go out of business, <laughs> one or the other, right? I find most people, they're not that interested in the truth. You have to kind of remind them this why this is important. I feel like mm-hmm. Liz Cheney sometimes, you know, yeah. <laughs> standing up there going, you know, what actually happened matters. Right. Reality matters, right? And uh, I mean, what a funny thing. I mean, she's my hero. And I don't agree with her on almost everything. Right. <laughs> politics, right? You know, she's pro-life. You know, Do you the, hope, I mean, will 
do you hope people are becoming more independent minded? I mean, that would help. Yes. Yeah. I like Andrew Yang's idea of a third, a viable third party. Of course, mm -hmm. he's not the first to bring this up. Forward party. I like this idea. Right. I, I'm not a big UBI guy, but you know, I think we, you know, the duopoly. He talks about the duopoly. Mm -hmm. You know, Germany, where my wife's from, they have what six or seven mm. parties that are viable parties. No one gets more than fifty percent. I mean, no one gets more than really twenty. 20-25%. Mm -hmm. That's good. That sounds great. That's a good note to end on. Michael Shermer, thanks for talking. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.